Laudator Jesus Christus. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the editor of uh, Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello to you, Brian, and hello all of you who are joining us live today. We're glad to have you with us, and a uh, happy feast of St. Charles Borromeo. Great, yes, happy. Uh, great doctor yeah. of the church. Yes, yes. It's good to see you again. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, see a lot of familiar names back. Uh, Mary McCoach, nice to see you again. Katie again. You're you're very faithful. You're almost the first person in the studio uh, or into the live stream every week. And Lillian Fernandez, nice to see you. Yes. Uh, we have a lot of really good stories for you this week. Um, well, interesting <laughs> stories. I don't know if they're all yes. good. But yes. yes. <laughs> Never a dull moment. No, no. So today, as I mentioned, is the November 4th, the Feast of St. Charles Borromeo, and he's a saint that's particularly important for our apostolate because our apostolate has always been very devoted to uh, catechesis, to teaching the faith through the reporting of news and giving a Catholic perspective. That's definitely the legacy of our friend, our dearly departed friend, John Venari, God rest his soul, was a master catechist and using the newspaper to uh, teach the faith. Mm -hmm. So St. Charles Borromeo, I'm just reading from my hand missile, the Archbishop of Milan, was one of the greatest and holiest prelates of the years when the Great Council of Trent was being completed and its enactments put into execution. And one of his greatest achievements, of course, was he was the chief editor of the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, and as our subscribers know, we have a long time running series in the newspaper going, um, you know, chapter by chapter, part by part through that catechism uh, with giving detailed commentary by a, a very good catechist named Matthew Plessy, who's, who runs um, a catechetical apostolate himself. So that's, uh, I've really enjoyed that series in the paper. I think it's been a, a really good one. So, uh, St. Charles Borromeo, he also reformed the clergy and renewed the spirit of the, the monasteries in his diocese. And he's also famous for personally ministering to, uh, you know, the poor people of Milan during a plague at that time. So he's also a saint that's particularly relevant for our times when we're dealing with uh, certainly not to the same uh, degree of gravity as far as the uh, you know, the death toll and all that kind of thing, but um, but definitely a saint relevant for our times with the COVID pandemic. Um, we had a suggestion from a, a viewer that we're going to take, instead of looking at the saints, you know, we've had a lot of great feasts that have just happened with um, the Feast of Christ the King, the last Sunday in October, followed immediately by uh, all saints and all souls, but we are gonna start looking forward to the coming week so kind of prepare ourselves for the saints that are coming up on the calendar. So uh, we have on November 8th, the commemoration of the four holy crowned martyrs who are four brothers, uh, Severus, Sever Severanus, uh, Car Carpophorus, and Victori Victorianus, or Victorius, who were cruelly put to death, my hand missile says, at Rome under Diocletian in the year of our Lord 304. So some martyrs coming up on the calendar. And then November 9th is a very important feast, especially for the for Latin Rite Roman Catholics, is the dedication of the Archbasilica of our Savior, also known as St. John Lateran. And my hand missile mentions the it's the mother and mistress of all churches throughout the world, the Church of St. John Lateran, um, or the Archbasilica of the Most Holy Savior was the first publicly consecrated. It was built by order of Constantine, the first Christian emperor, and consecrated by Pope St. Sylvester on November 9th, 324. So that's a very special feast. It's actually the uh, cathedral church of the Pope. Typically, we associate the Pope with St. Peter's Basilica because that's where uh, the Apostle St. Peter is buried, but his cathedral church as Bishop of Rome is actually St. John Lateran. And then looking a little bit further ahead, so next week when we have our show, it'll be the Feast of St. Martin of Tours, who is my confirmation saint, so I'll look forward to telling you about him when we get to uh, next week's show. I don't know if Brian had anything he wanted to add about the, the saints and the feasts recently. 
No, again, a great, great saint today, St. Charles Barmeo. I actually went to St. Charles Barmeo uh, Catholic School, primary school, uh, which in the great springtime of Vatican II is now closed uh, due to lack of parishioners. (laughs) So the great overwhelming success of the new evangelization. (laughs) And it's ironic, uh, um, the the school was an old building from the forties or fifties and they actually built a brand new building. I always remember because I always would pass the cornerstone going into school for the first four grades. They divided first through fourth, fifth or eighth because uh, okay. there were so many kids. So they built a whole new school in 1970. That's what wow. they were thinking in 1970. Wow. We have to have a whole second building. And then within you know my lifetime, now the whole school, both buildings are shut because there's not enough mm. people. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Yes. Well, St. Charles Borromeo, pray for us in our yes. times for yes. a resurgence of Catholic uh, culture and education and everything. Yes. So turning now towards uh, our news stories, our, our stories today are going to include, uh, of course, uh, first and foremost, President Biden's meeting with Pope Francis, uh, the infamous meeting where the Pope supposedly told Biden that he's a good Catholic and should keep receiving communion. <laughs> which he proceeded to do the next day. We'll get into that. Um, And then kind of a dovetail to that first story is this new um, USCCB draft document on the Holy Eucharist, which was discussed, as you may recall, back in June at their June uh, meeting. And they'll be meeting in, uh, I guess, later this month to discuss the draft document. Uh, So we'll get into the particulars of that. We also have a brief update regarding the the Vatican China deal. Thus, unfortunately, another you know faithful underground true bishop of the church has been seized by the Chinese Communist Party. So the deal is not worth, more proof that the deal was a terrible idea and yeah is going to bear horrible fruits. Uh, we are also going to touch upon a couple of recent updates involving the United States Supreme Court. Um, so Brian, our uh, our Resident legal experts going to take us through those that are related to a situation in Maine with I think with um, healthcare workers and then also the the Texas Heartbeat Act which we've reported on in a previous show and then we'll end on I think on a more or less a positive note the recent uh, Samorum Pontificum Rome pilgrimage was held and they were able to have a, a you know a, a solemn high mass I don't think it was pontifical because there was no bishop involved this year, if I recall correctly, uh, not a bishop offering the mass, but it was held in St. Peter's Basilica and our our friend and colleague, uh, Edward Penton at the National Catholic Register in his write-up, he was able to attend in person and got some really nice photos. So we'll we'll share some of those with you. All right. Well, I guess I reversed Sorry. the order today. I did, uh, I did the <laughs> oh, six first funny. and then the introduction. <laughs> That's so. fine. So now we know what's coming. But we yes. uh, will start with uh, Biden in Rome. Uh, he's only the second president of the United States to be elected who uh, is baptized and purports to be a uh, Catholic. John F. Kennedy obviously being the first. John F. Kennedy didn't set a great uh, uh, path as the first Catholic president, because as many people know, before being elected in Houston, he made a speech where he basically said he wouldn't follow his Catholic beliefs, that his you know his Catholic beliefs will have no influence on him as president. Um, and it, it's interesting that that was kind of his pledge to the secular state that he made before getting elected. And uh, Joe Biden clearly seems to be doing that even more extensively than uh, John F. Kennedy ever did, uh, that he... I just yeah. just something that came to mind with JFK. It's even more astounding that he would say something like that because it was before the council. So it was yes. before we even had that, you know, those novelties of the council. He was saying those things like almost in anticipation of the council. Yes, very true. So uh, President Biden the, did go to uh, Rome, uh, just like Nancy Pelosi. He was granted a, uh, a private audience. Although interesting, I'm not really sure what to make of this detail. He was, um, uh, there, no press were allowed to be there when the two met. So again, typically, even when President Trump went, the press are not there in the room listening to their whole conversation. But usually the press are invited uh, to be there, to take pictures, to see them meet each other. They may say just a few words and then, you know, they withdraw. Uh, in this case, the press were like forbidden essentially to be there and only a Vatican 
a reporter or a Vatican official reporters were there taking pictures of it. Uh, again, right. it's, it's still a little strange why they, uh, why they, and it was that. also, as I understand it, that was also a very last minute change. Originally there were supposed, there was supposed to be press access to the, at least to the president's arrival, but he, they were the, yes. Uh, other than Vatican media, which is, you know, government run media, basically, um, well, not basically yes. it is yes. that yes. those were the only ones allowed. So, yes. So we'll just look here a little bit of the footage. You get a sense of the demeanor uh, of, you know, of the two uh, here. It's a very cordial meeting as you'll very see. Very cordial, very close. Again, he's um, holding on to him there. They're very smile, all smiles, all happiness. Um, <laughs> look at that face. <laughs> yeah. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, again, uh, very much like when Pelosi was there. Uh, it doesn't look like a lot of admonishing going on, uh, <laughs> just from the the demeanor. Uh, and then we did contrast that last time when Pelosi was there to the sort of frown and grumpy face uh, that that you know meeting President Trump. So clearly, right. it's not just you know it doesn't just greet everybody this way. Um, definitely not not the case. So in any event, they met behind closed doors. We don't know exactly, you know. We don't have any rec reporting uh, that or, or recording it, but uh, President Biden then uh, emerged from it and had been a has was asked a little bit about the conversation and uh, had some interesting things to say. So we're going to play a quick clip from a while he was still in Europe, a meeting with the press. If be before we do that, could I just read quickly the uh, the official account, the Holy See press communique, as well as sure. the um, and the the White House. Give yes. you an idea of this is like the official Pravda account of what happened, right. you could say. Uh, so the Holy See press office says this morning, Friday, October 29th, 2021, His Excellency Joseph R. Biden, President of the United States of America, was received in audience by the Holy Father Francis and subsequently met with His Eminence Cardinal Secretary of State Pietro Parolin, who also happens to be this is my commentary one of the chief architects of the vatican china deal mm -hmm. uh and who cardinal Perlin was accompanied by his excellency archbishop paul richard gallagher secretary for relations with states and this is the holy see's um, summary of what was discussed during the course of the cordial discussions the parties focused on the joint commitment to the protection and care of the planet uh, which that's really why one of the big reasons why Biden was going over to Rome in the first place was to participate in the G20 summit, which is an economic, the you know, a meeting of the world's mm -hmm. major eco economic contributors. But it also has a very green thrust, mm -hmm. especially this year with the, you know, he went from that meeting in Rome on to Glasgow for uh, the what was it COP26, COP26, which was, yeah, yeah, COP26, the climate change meeting. So climate change is definitely at the forefront of all of this. Um, the Vatican statement also says the healthcare situation and the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the theme of refugees and assistance to migrants. Reference was also made to the protection of human rights, although not the rights of unborn children, as Biden says, as we'll see, mm. uh, including freedom of religion and conscience. And it closes by saying, finally, the talks were uh, the talks enabled an exchange of views on some matters regarding the current international situation. Also, in the context of the imminent G20 summit, which started the following day, October 30th, and on the promotion of peace in the world through political negotiation. Mm -hmm. Well, as as we celebrated uh, just the the day before. Let me think. No, actually, the was, October 31st. Two days after. Yeah, yeah, two days after the Feast of Christ the King. We know f from uh, Pius XI's magnificent encyclical Quas Primum uh, that men will only know the, you know, true peace in the king, the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. I forget the exact quote, but trying to pursue world peace through political negotiations is a an exercise in futility. So we need supernatural means in order to achieve that peace, specifically the consecration of Russia to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart in order to enjoy the promised period of world peace, you know, that that is given by God in heaven, not by political authorities. So before we play that clip, just very quickly, this is the brief little snippet that the White House released about the meeting. Um, in his audience with Pope Francis today, President Biden thanked His Holiness for his advocacy for the world's poor 
and those suffering from hunger, conflict, and persecution. He lauded Pope Francis's leadership in fighting the climate crisis, as well as his advocacy to ensure the pandemic ends for everyone through the jab, share, through jab sharing and an equitable global economic recovery. So interestingly, I was looking at some of the G20 and the, the COP26 literature last night, and they, I found in both of them the phrase build back better. Uh, not surprising. That's that's Biden's was his campaign phrase. That's his big legislative phrase right now. Build back better. So now we will see what he had to say when a reporter asked him if the issue of abortion came up during the meeting. Did the issue of abortion come up at all? No, we didn't. It came up. We just talked about the fact that he was happy. I was a good Catholic. So does that mean the big chest conversation specifically came up? Okay, sir. Uh, and there, again, did the issue of abortion come up? And I find the answer really interesting. Did the issue of abortion come up? No. Only in the context, he says, only in that he's saying I'm a good Catholic. So he's linking that to the issue of abortion, Biden. I mean, that's, that's what's amazing about that. And then he makes this claim that Pope Francis said, keep going to communion. Right. Uh, now, not surprisingly, because this is how this pope operates, uh, some people went to the Vatican and said, is this true? Did Pope Francis really tell him this? And what does the Vatican say? They cannot confirm or deny what, what right. was said about this topic, which is exactly what happened. This is how Pope Francis operates. Remember, there's a woman from South America who said Pope Francis talked to her on the phone and she's divorced and civilly remarried and told her to keep receiving communion. And then right. the, oh, we can't really comment on that. It was a private phone call. So he does these things. He knows they're going to be reported. And then again, if he didn't say this, why doesn't the Vatican Mountain say, well, that's not true. He didn't say it. Obviously, exactly. they're indirectly signaling, yes, Pope Francis did say yes. this. This is all, so several, as Brian mentioned, several reporters, and I was in touch with a couple of them that uh, were trying to get an answer from the Vatican. And the Holy See Press Office Director, um, Dr. Matteo Bruni, would simply said, quote, I would consider it a private conversation, and it is limited to what was said in the public statement, referring to the press release that yes. I read to you. So they've refused to either confirm or deny, which obviously allows the rumor mill to keep going. Yes. Well, it went further. At a, a later press uh, release, or sorry, press conference, uh, the same topic came up uh, again. The, the more than 50 million Catholics back at home are seeing something play out that has never happened before this split in the conservative wing of the Catholic Church, moving, moving to deny someone like you, a, a Catholic president, the sacrament of communion. What, for, for these Catholic backs home, back home, what did it mean for you to hear Pope Francis in the wake of this, in the middle of this debate, call you a good Catholic? And did what he tell you, should that put this debate to rest? So let's just pause there for a minute before we hear Biden bumble through this look at how biased this question is right she basically right. the conservative catholics are the bad guys right right the, they're the bad people the 50 million catholics in the u.s notice she kind of lumps all together they're the bad guys uh because they're trying to like deny the oh so you're this catholic president they're trying to deny you the sacraments like right not like we're trying to do system. something unjust. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The whole premise of the question, and you went to the Pope and ha ha, na 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 to them. Is sort of what she's <laughs> saying. So right. now this is kind of, so that's a very pointed question. Here's the answer. Look, I'm, I'm not going to, a lot of this is just personal. Um, Pope Francis has become a, uh, I don't want to exaggerate it. It's become a, uh, someone who's provided great solace for my family when my son died. He has, uh, he is, in my view, uh, um, there's always been this debate in the Catholic Church, uh, going back to Pope John the 23rd, um, that uh, talk about how we uh, reach out and uh, embrace people with differences. If you notice what well, what, what the Pope said when it was asked when he first got elected Pope, he was traveling with the press, and they said, what's your position on homosexuality? I said, who am I to judge? This is a man who is of 
great empathy. He is a man who understands that part of his uh, Christianity is to reach out and to forgive. Um, and uh, so I just find my relationship with him one that I personally take great solace in. He is a really, truly, genuine, decent man. And I'll end by saying that, uh, you know, there are an awful lot of people who, and many of you, not I'm not putting you in this position, I apologize, but many of you who are even in the press who went out of your way to express your empathy and sympathy when I lost the real part of my soul, when I, when I, when I lost my beau, my son. And um, I, uh, my family will never forget my extended family because when I come, it was only a matter of days since my son had passed and away. And he goes, goes on for quite a while. It goes that. on for quite a while now, but you get yeah. the gist of where he's going. Um, again, the whole, that whole thing was just bizarre. First of all, it's like, this is obviously something people are going to ask about. And he seems like, uh, buh, 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 like can't even figure out what he's trying to say, right? It's, his whole beginning, uh, it was garbled. And he's like, well, I don't want to exaggerate, but and he doesn't even really even answer the question at right. first. And but then it's interesting that he goes yeah. back ultimately to yes. Vatican II and John the Twenty Third. That was very interesting. Very interesting. Oh, we've been having this since John the Twenty Third, and he, it's sort of garbled. Even that, what he's really referring to, but he's sort of Please. essentially saying. Oh, good. I was just going to say the discussion about worthiness to receive Holy Communion goes back way back, <laughs> well, much further than John the Twenty Third. It goes back to the apostles in the New Testament. Right, but the debate that, that's going on now, the, the sort of undermining of that, doesn't even go back to John the Twenty Third. John the Twenty Third, if you had said, uh, he, even John the Twenty Third would have said, no, they can't have communion. I mean, it would have been no doubt in John the Twenty Third's mind. Uh, right, that's sort right. of how far we've come from even the time of John the Twenty Third. Right. Um, it, it's just really amazing, and he immediately latches on the "Who am I to judge?" Right, the infamous statement uh, of of Pope Francis about right. uh, 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 sin against nature. Right. So, the, kind of the last facet of this story before we move on, um, more than just yes. the talk about it, Biden actually did receive. We know that, uh, from eyewitness testimony, there was a. An Associated Press reporter, her name is Nicole Winfield. I believe she's the Rome correspondent for the AP. Yes. And she personally witnessed him receive Holy Communion. It was at the same parish, uh, St. Patrick's Church, the, the, the so-called American community in Rome near the U.S. Embassy, uh, where Nancy Pelosi attended and was planning to be the, you know, as the Pope or as the, as the priest there said, she was going to do the second reading when she was there October 9th, but um, was, you know, some people reported was heckled. Other people say, no, it was, there was an anti-vax protest going on nearby that turned violent, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the, I'll link to this Associated Press article where you can see photographs of Joe and Joe Biden in the congregation and, um, Nicole Winfield says she saw the she saw the priest um, give Holy Communion to the president. So, and again, this is the headlines around the world, right? Biden receives communion in Rome amid debate right. in U.S. So again, exactly. it's like that that reporter. I don't know who she was from that first reporter, but what's the matter with you, U.S. bishops? Are you more Catholic than the Pope? I mean, that's essentially right. what they're what they're saying. And there's a there's something in this article that I have to touch on because I want to read something that uh, in, to corrected basically so the the rector of this parish of this community uh father stephen petroff uh who who is the one who gave biden the eucharist said he had never denied the sacrament to anyone just like pope francis has said on his way back to rome uh from his trip to slovakia he mentioned that specifically and he yes. as brian i think reported he brought up the you know thinking it was funny that he gave Holy Communion to a non-Catholic at a nursing home. Yes. So this is what Father Petrov said to, uh, to Ms. Winfield. Quote, first of all, I don't know what is going on inside anyone's mind when they come to receive the Eucharist. Um, well, actually, you do when the person tells you what's on their mind. Right. Again, the, this is not like some random unknown person who comes up and you've never seen before in Rome who's a tourist. 
Yeah, yes, the priest doesn't have to interrogate them and say, by the way, are you living in sin? Do you? No, obviously not. But right. when you're the president of the United States and what you believe. When you have public yes, positions. Yeah. Exactly. It's not a matter of speculation. It is well known. Yeah. And you, he has reaffirmed them even since becoming you know, inaugurated. Right. Uh, you know, that's just disingenuous to, oh, I don't know. Oh. I don't know. Who am I to know? Right. Well, we right. do know what people believe when they tell us. So that's the first thing he said. And then he also told Associated Press, quote, and secondly, I am not the Eucharist police. The Eucharist, as Pope Francis and many popes have said, is medicine for those who need it. Well, actually, Father, I have news for you from St. John Chrysostom and many, you know, the entire history of the church. You are the Eucharist police. That is part of your job. Yes, Yes, you are. And in fact, this is another phrase that does come from tradition, but is misused by modernists, that the, the Blessed Sacrament is a medicine in the sense that, and again, it's not, it's a modern phraseology to call it medicine, but that the, that it is uh, efficacious to us against sin, because we know that the reception worthily of Holy Communion blots out venial sin and gives us strength to not commit mortal sin in the future. That's all true. If big, if we receive Holy Communion in a state of grace. Right. If we're spiritually if, alive. Yes. Yeah. If we're not, it does not blot out venial sin. It, oh. It's sort of like if you take medicine, but you're taking another medicine at the same time that counteracts that medicine. Like some kind of pharmacists will look at drug interactions. And sometimes if you're taking some medicine, it'll prevent another medicine from functioning. Well, that's what mortal sin does. It, it, it right. prevents and blocks those effects. Right. And let's be clear. If you openly knowingly deny any single truth of the Catholic faith, you are in a state of mortal sin, denying the, a, a tenet of the Catholic yes. faith. Knowingly and obstinately, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And again, he's been in politics 40 years. He knows what the church teaches and he obstinately denies it. So yes. uh, th- we're not talking about speculation here. Right. We're talking about known facts. So to close this story, I just wanted to quote from, and I think I've quoted from this before with uh, the Nancy Pelosi story, but it's worth repeating. This is from St. John Chrysostom, uh, homily 82 He's preaching on towards the end of the gospel of St. Matthew with the Last Supper. And he says this, these things I say to you that receive and to you that minister. He's he's preaching about Holy Communion. For it is necessary to address myself to you also, referring to the priests, uh, that you may with much care distribute the gifts there. There is no small punishment for you, meaning priests and bishops, if being conscious of any wickedness in any man, for example, Joe Biden, you allow him to partake of this table. And then Chrysostom quotes from the book of Ezekiel, his blood shall be required at your hands. So Father wow. Petrov, you really need to seriously reconsider your position. Yes. And he, he goes on to say, uh, though anyone be a general through a, though a deputy, though he be he himself who is invested with the diadem, that's a reference to the emperor. So if the emperor were to come to St. John Chrysostom in those days and, and John Chrysostom knew that he was public and obstinate in sin, he would have to refuse him, even if it cost him his life, even if the emperor said, off with your head. Mm. And ultimately, he, clo- he ends this section by saying, fear God, not man. If thou shouldst fear man, thou wilt be laughed to scorn even by him. But if God, thou wilt be an object of respect, even to men. No one respects a priest who says, I'm not the Eucharist police. No. Well, fortunately, at least one bishop has stood up against this outrage that occurred in Rome. And not surprisingly, Archbishop Carlo Maria uh, Vigano. Yes. And again, we, we're happy to publish his statement. I'll just read one bit from it. Even if what Biden said corresponds perfectly to the intemperate quips of Jorge Maria Bogolio, who called a notoriously radical abortion activist a great Italian, it is evident that such statements represent an unheard of scandal since they fail to condemn the positions of a political personality who supports abortion disavows the immutable position of the magisterium of the church and resounds as a blatant invitation to commit sacrilege, profaning the most holy Eucharist by receiving it in the state of public and manifest sin. 
Uh, again, thank God for Archbishop Vigano to be a sane voice in the midst of this nonsense. Yes, absolutely. So that first story does lead into uh, really our second story, uh, which is something we have reported on uh, previously. So at the June mis uh, mis meeting excuse me, of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, a debate that was reported widely in the press occurred about whether the USCCB should issue a new document on this topic basically the reception unworthily of Holy Communion by public figures. I now, think they referred to it by it, the term Eucharistic it, consistency. Exactly. Like all sort of bureaucratic. politicians, bureaucratic, <laughs> they have to have like euphemisms for it. <laughs> Eucharistic <laughs> consistency. Again, our Lord, yes, yes, no, no. Call it what it is, a sacrilege. I mean, read, look, contrast that with Archbishop Vigano. It's a sacrilege. So right. I'm issuing a document on this sacrilege, um, Eucharistic consistency. But they, they had a little debate and they decided to go forward and draft a document. Um, and they said, well, it won't just focus on that, et cetera. Well, a draft of that document has uh, finally uh, emerged. Um, the group over at the pillar has uh, gotten a copy of it and they did a, a bit of a report uh, on it. Uh, it's 26 pages. Now, again, this is not the official document. This is a draft. So the committee right. that was appointed went away and drafted it, and then it will come back to the UCCB for comment and amendment. And, and so it's in no way a final document, but uh, it's very interesting to to read. It's really very much a, 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 a mixed document in a certain sense, and, and in many ways, a, a waste of time, in my opinion. So the right. good side of it, it does state and reiterate clear Catholic teaching that the the uh, consecration works a substantial change in the bread and wine. They are sub become substantially uh, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. So they restate mm. the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is good. Uh, but they really seem to be missing the entire point of what's going on. So they just sort of reiterate the true the true teaching uh, and acknowledge two problems, but don't make any connection between events like Biden receiving communion publicly right. and what's going on. So it's almost as if thing, they think is, that it's almost if, as if they think that producing more documents is somehow going to remedy the situation when the yes. real problem is that they're simply not willing to enforce the church's discipline. Yes. It's kind of uh, like a parent saying to a child, like, you know, or do you really understand that you're not supposed to do this? Can I let, let's go over it in a document or something like, as opposed to just punishing the child so that they learn this is wrong. Yes. You can't do that. Yes. So as you can tell, I've read through the whole document. Nowhere does it even address or mention the issue of public figures, public sinners, as Archbishop Vigano calls them, and the requirements that they be denied. Again, the requirement under canon law. Now they quote canon law, the provision that's saying, that if it's a known public skin that, sin that gives scandal, they should be denied communion. But they never take the next step and apply it and say, therefore. So uh, absolutely, absolutely missing. But I want to get back to this point. They essentially, this is the whole post-conciliar problem. Right? This is John Paul II mentioning that there's a silent apostasy, uh, saying that there's a crisis in the church, but then never like really willing to admit what the cause of the crisis is. So I just want to read, there, there's sure two things. One, they kind of acknowledge there's a massive problem in the church related to recept to belief in the Blessed Sacrament and to the obligation to go to Mass. So they admit the crisis, but don't actually want to admit the causes. So paragraph three says, the pandemic forced us to stay physically distant from one another and for a time to view the celebration of Mass on a television or computer screen. Pause. First of all, no, you're wrong. The pandemic right. didn't force that. You chose to do that, contrary yes. to the way great saints of the church have worked. So, and remember, in the United States, there are about two or three states where the civil law illegally and unlawfully attempted to do that. Pause. The bishop should have stood up and refused. But right. even if you put those states aside, every other state, the civil law did not prohibit people from going to mass. The bishops did. But right. notice they don't take any responsibility. Oh, the pandemic. It, it just forced us yep. wrong. Although many of the faithful, it continues, appear to have had their faith and their desire for the Eucharist strengthened by such a long, um, a long, sorry, I have to change, go, go through the footnotes, uh, separation. We worry that others have lived without mass for so long. 
may have become discouraged or accustomed to life without the Eucharist. Oh, you think so? Really? Well, we were saying that at the time. What are you thinking, bishops? People are just right. going to get used to it. And I know this, and we all know this anecdotally. I know people in my family who have not been to Mass since the beginning, even though the churches are open again. Why? Right. They just got used to not going. I don't need to go anymore. Um, yet we should never forget the words of Christ. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Again, great. They quote that. But what are they going to do about it? They right. don't go on to say, so we're going to go out and and start preaching, going on TV saying, hey, it's over. Mass is open. You're in a state of mortal sin if you don't come to Mass. If you're, again, maybe you're in the hospital. Obviously, the normal exceptions apply. But if right. you are perfectly healthy and you're not in the hospital, you're in a state of mortal sin if you are not fulfilling your your the precept of the church without a legitimate excuse. But, but they don't propose doing that. So again, once again, they see... We've made a mess here. We've now, because all the statistics are showing mass attendance is way down. Huge dip, not recovered from the pandemic. And they're like, oh, gee, wow, I guess that stopped people going to mass. Oh, well, we'll just quote this whole thing and it'll all be over. Um, and now, frankly, you, you, frankly, you wonder if they're more concerned about people's lack of faith or the, the lack of money in the collection basket. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay, I, think that's yeah. fair, I think that's a fair question at this point. <laughs> Yes. And then secondly, they go on because they note in this in this uh, document, they're very concerned because they refer to studies saying that people don't believe in the real presence anymore. A and they say they're concerned about that. And that's why they went to issue this document. OK, that's good that they're finally woken up to this. This has been going on for decades, decline of belief in the real presence. Right. But again, they don't want to get to the real root of the problem. Oh, well, we just need, as Matt said, another document. But the real root of the problem is the Novus Ordo undermines and destroys faith in the real presence through communion in the hand, through the lack of genuflections, through the lack of purifying fingers, from the lack of res reserving the preconical fingers, and the lack of only having deacons and priests hand out communion. Again, I can go on and on and on, the lack of prayers that refer to the, the true presence, that the Novus Ordo is the cause, the primary cause for the, de the decline of belief in the real presence. Nowhere do they even address that in this document. So again, it's like John Paul II, oh, we've got this massive silent apostasy. Oh, well, nothing we can do about it. Not Vatican II's fault. That's essentially what's going on in this document. Um, so again, as long as they you know, they mention some traditional things, they even quote canon law, but it, it's just meaningless words if they're not really going to deal with the real underlying problems, which are Vatican Absolutely. II and the New Mass. And when it comes to the, the worthy reception of Holy Communion, we don't need another 26-page document. They, we need already to know. <laughs> read, they need to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 to 29, and actually enforce it. They, they, act, they need to read Canon 915, which says, quote, those who have been excommunicated or interdicted after the imposition or declaration of the penalty and others obstinately persevering in manifest grave sin are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. If they would just uh, implement, if they would just enforce that sentence, that clause of a sentence, that's all that needs to be done. We don't need this whole new document. People can go read the catechism that St. Charles Borough Mayo edited, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which has beautiful Eucharistic theology in it. You know, they're, they're, it's really a, a waste of time, I think, as Brian said, to come out with this new document when the church already has these resources. They just need to make use of them. Yes, and, and do what they should do. I mean, frankly, Joe Biden should be excommunicated. Right. If he persists, he should be warned and excommunicated. Uh, let alone benign from communion. I mean, this is a person who's promoting and what and trying to force 300 million Americans to pay for the murder of children in their mother's womb, contrary to the fifth commandment. Uh, but, but you know, we'll just have a 26 page document. One other just brief sort of not very important note. Uh, but another thing I noted reading this document is the, the sort of we, we mentioned the Eucharistic consistency, the euphemisms, right. the, the always using sort of different vocabulary, right? You go to a traditional priest, you hear a sermon, you're all you're going to hear is primarily the blessed sacraments, the real presence, right? That That's what you're constantly, again, maybe occasionally the Eucharist, but Vatican II speak, they rarely want to use those traditional terms. 
the real problem. Again, they do occasionally throughout the document, but it's very mm -hmm. laced with, uh, again, the Eucharist. The modernists loved the word the Eucharist because it, Eucharist means Thanksgiving, and the Eucharist is a Thanksgiving. We are thankful for it, but it's they, they try to use it because they can wiggle the meaning. And it's like, oh, right. we're receiving communion for Thanksgiving. And, and it doesn't clearly convey. Now, again, there's nothing wrong if your traditional priest says Eucharist. There's nothing wrong with it. There's something wrong with kind of trying to downplay the blessed sacrament, the real presence, and use this. And then use even more ambiguous terms. The mysteries. They always want to. It's like the Paschal mystery ambiguity. The mysteries. They, they always want to. Well, Yes, the Blessed Sacrament is a mystery, but we know exactly what it is. The mystery is how it happens, right? How transubstantiation can be possible is the mystery. That it happens is not a mystery. And then there's some of the other phrases, communion with the church, all these things. I always find interesting that they kind of have to muddy the vocabulary, uh, even if they're trying to be somewhat conservative. It reminds me of an old joke. I actually think it was Jerry Maddox who told me this. He said, yeah, you know, I know the old old priest, ah, the old Irish, ah, what's wrong with the church, you know? I don't really know what the problem is, but all I know is once the Holy Ghost changed his name to the Holy Spirit, everything went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And again, there's sort of something to it. The language, the, this mixing up of language traces the, uh, tracks the reality. But uh, yes. anyway, after that bad joke, we'll move on to the next story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is just kind of a, a brief, a news brief, a kind of a segue into our next story, but um, it is having to do with the the terrible Vatican China deal that was uh, originally signed, the secret deal. We haven't seen all the terms of it. We just know that it has to do with the appointment of bishops, basically granting that uh, to the Chinese Communist Party, and then the Pope more or less just rubber stamps his his uh, choice. So the latest news on this uh, terrible deal was reported by Asia News on October twenty sixth. And the headline reads, uh, when Zhao authorities detain Bishop Xiao Zhumin again, uh, officially the cleric was taken on vacation. <laughs> That's what the, the communists call it, vacation. Uh, he is often subjected on a serious note to brainwashing to put him, to push him rather, to join the official church. That, In other words, the Chinese uh, Catholic Patriotic Association, the quote unquote Catholic arm of the Chinese Communist Party. And it says it was targeted on the eve of the month of the dead. So the bishop in question is, as I mentioned, Monsignor uh, Xiao Zhu, Zhu Min, who is Bishop of Wenzhou. And Asia News has learned this from sources on the ground who relay that the bishop was officially taken away on vacation, more like to a uh, re-education camp, no doubt, uh, similar to a concentration yes. camp, probably. Um, so the Asian News report goes on to say, in a message, Chinese Catholics ask for prayers for the kidnapped bishop, quote, pray that the Lord will give him confidence and courage that he will not be demoralized by what happened. Pray also that he will remain healthy and whole under the guidance of Christ uh, so that he may return to us as soon as possible to shepherd his flock. Let us pray together. So we certainly will remember his excellency in our prayers that he will be returned to his flock, uh, God willing, as soon as possible. And, and ultimately that God will raise up a pope in the near future who will undo this horrible deal and who will defend the, the true church in China from the the powers that be there from the the deep state uh yes. from the the red dragon you could say and again this just is another example that you just say what did you buy with your surrender right again if it, the deal was a bad deal but even if they were saying well look it, it at least ended persecution against these underground bishops it, it it gave them space so we yeah we gave up the principle of papal authority over the church in exchange for at least that. Now they're showing like they didn't even get that. And in fact, there right. are many people I'm hearing from Asia who are reporting 
that the Vatican essentially is unveiling, is letting them know, the communists, where the underground bishops are, is identifying them for them oh, uh, in terms of way of, of uh, you know, there are Vatican officials. Now, again, I haven't seen proof of that, but some people I know who, who, have, who are very close to China have said that that is, is going on, that they're they're because now they're communicating with the Patriotic Association and giving out names is sort of in the course of that, of these dialogues of who they are. And again, here is just, you know, what did you buy? There's there's just more persecution. Right. You haven't bought anything with your surrender. And something else I think worth mentioning before we get into the Supreme Court updates, you know, Archbishop Vigano, as Brian knows very well, he's edited a book on Archbishop Vigano's writings called A Voice in the Wilderness. It's a really good resource to have on hand because Archbishop Vigano identifies this, um, you know, years ago we used to hear about the axis of evil. And I think it was, what was that? George W. Bush would talk about that in the early mm -hmm. 2000s. So now we have kind of this diabolical triangle between Rome, Beijing, and Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. now with, with uh, President Biden. And I forget exactly how Archbishop Vigano describes it, but China, the Chinese Communist Party is integral to the, the evil situation in the church in the yes. world right now. Yes, absolutely. Well, we'll go on a little update on two stories at the U.S. Supreme Court this past week um, that are, are kind of not very hopeful bellwethers. So there was a case coming out of the state of Maine where Maine get made a, a mandate that all healthcare workers uh, receive a certain uh, um, poke in their arm uh, that uh, you all get what I'm talking about. Uh, and what was important about that is they didn't even provide for the possibility of a religious exemption. So again, there's some reports of the government uh, agencies and, and, and private companies just, you know, denying them just in practice, just saying, nope, nope, nope. But at least in theory saying, okay, you can ask for a religious exemption, um, which would be required by law, uh, that you must make a, a reasonable accommodation for someone's employment to accommodate their religious beliefs. But Maine just didn't even, like New York did, just forget it. New York, uh, as we've reported on, Chris Farrar brought a lawsuit uh, against the state of New York, has an injunction in place in the federal court saying, no, you can't do that. You need to, you cannot do away with a religious exemption as a possibility. Uh, Maine just did the same thing. Uh, they are in a different part of the federal court system and have, and uh, there have been suits by healthcare workers uh, that have gone nowhere. So they made an emergency appeal to the Supreme Court because the time was coming for comply or be fired. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went to the Supreme Court saying, look, it just at least grant an injunction saying while this litigation is going on, while this is getting figured out, you can't be fired. Supreme Court refused to do that. Now, to be careful, they didn't rule on the case. They didn't say Maine's fine, but they just said, we're not going to intervene to help you out. Um, what's sad about that is the liberal justices who were not surprised because they hate religion said, you know, fine. But they were joined by Chief Justice Roberts, again, and not another surprise, surprise, uh, Chief Justice Benedict Arnold Roberts. Uh, but they were also joined by Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh, two Trump appointees, uh, who, again, uh, where was reasonable hope would be pretty good. Um, but su surprising, they're siding with Roberts and the liberals to say we're not going to get involved. Now, again, there may be several reasons they don't want to do that as a preliminary emergency mm -hmm. appeal, but it does mean they're willing to hang these people out to dry. As one report I saw said, you know, these are frontline healthcare workers who put their lives at risk for throughout the pandemic, who are treating and taking care of people. And now Maine's just saying, goodbye, we're done with you. We're throwing you out uh, because you will not comply with our diktat. Uh, and right. again, sadly, the Supreme Court didn't intervene to help them. But the lawsuit will go on, but they will be out of their job uh, unless the, the state changes their mind. So that's not very encouraging. The second one relates to SB8, the uh, law in Texas, so-called called called the heartbeat law that makes it uh, not possible to have an abortion after a fetal heartbeat, or as the liberals like to euphemistically call it, cardiac activity. <laughs> which is not a heartbeat uh, to them, but a heartbeat, we call things what they are here, uh, right. <laughs> which is usually about eight weeks after uh, the woman's last cycle, uh, which means, you know, there's still possibility for abortion, but it's erratic, radically reduced. Twice uh, now, uh, the Supreme Court has been asked, will you just stop this law from going into an effect? And they said, no, we'll wait, let it go through litigation. So like the main case, not ruling on the merits, but they they said, Look, the law's in force until you know later. 
Uh, even though a federal judge enjoined it, they put it back in place, said just let the litigation happen mm-hmm. twice. But again, when liberals don't get the answer they want, they go back again, right? When they don't, when they, they, it's like in Europe, when they proposed having all the people in Europe vote for a radically progressive liberal constitution, it was voted down in two countries. They just went back and said, oh, we'll just do it again. We'll just take a different vote. Um, that, that's what they do. So they went back to the Supreme Court a third time. Uh, this time, the Biden administration and the uh, attorney general in name only, that horrible person, Merrick Garland. Thank God he's not on the Supreme Court as Obama <laughs> wanted, uh, who's been the, the worst. I think I used to think Eric Holder was bad. This guy's just makes Eric Holder look like a great attorney general. Uh, he filed this lawsuit, joined it, and is saying the government, the federal government ha- has a right to stop this, this uh, Texas law. Mm-hmm. So the Supreme Court, instead of what they normally do for these emergency appeals in all of them and just rule and just say yes or no, they had hours of oral argument this week where they had the they had them brief the, case, the position. And again, this is a very narrow issue. While the, they haven't even started the case yet, they just filed it while mm-hmm. they're considering the case in the lower court. Should the Supreme Court stop the law from being in effect? And that law has saved tens, probably thousands of babies' lives, we're told, in Texas since it's been in effect. Now, because of virtually abortion stopped. So what's interesting is often in those hearings where the judges ask questions, you really get a sense of where they're going. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alito, uh, Justices Alito and Thomas and Gorsuch, very clear. They said, look, we've already rel- ruled on this. The, the law should stay in force while this is going on. So very clear what they think. Uh, Kavanaugh and Kate Barrett were very disappointing. They were saying very skeptical. They were saying, you know, that this this law, how can it stay in effect? Uh, really, really gave very strong indications. And all, from all points of the spectrum, the reports of people who listened to the oral argument are mm-hmm. they were signaling we're going to vote to stop the law while the litigation goes on. Now, there's some explanations for it. Um, Texas, as we said, used a very novel approach saying that rather than the police enforcing this, private citizens could bring private civil lawsuits. Uh, Probably if they do it, what they'll say is we're worried about that. We don't like the precedent of these private lawsuits. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's all they're ruling on, but not on the subject of abortion per se. Uh, But again, it's not a good sign because the big abortion case is coming up December 1st, a different state's law, which has asked the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. So that case, they have, have formally said, overturn Roe v. Wade, allow these laws and say that's bad law. That is coming up. This this argument that I listened to earlier in the week, not good sign for Barrett and Kavanaugh. So maybe they will also be uh, traitors uh, and, and betray uh, well, their own faith. They're both Catholics, uh, their own faith and uh, be part of this. But hopefully not. But the signs this week were not very good. Well, it sounds like we certainly need to remember them in our prayers as well, that they will do the right thing. Yes, that they the grace of the Holy Ghost will touch them. Yes, absolutely. And speaking of grace, we will end uh, our, this week's news report on a, a note of grace. The uh, the annual Samorum Pontificum uh, Rome pilgrimage took place over the weekend, uh, the Feast of Christ the King in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica. And I think we're going to try and display that article by our friend and colleague, uh, Edward Penton, writing, he's the Rome correspondent for the National Catholic Register. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Brian. So as you can see, he's got some very nice photos. Uh, Edward Penton was able to attend the mass in person and see it being offered there at the at the altar of the chair in St. Peter's. Uh, so I'll just read a little bit from his report. It says, the 10th Sumorum Pontificum Rome pilgrimage concluded over the weekend, uh, drawing a throng of pilgrims and comprising a traditional uh, solemn high mass in St. Peter's Basilica. So yeah, as I thought, it was it was a solemn high mass. So there were several priests involved in offering the mass but there was no bishop so it was not a pontifical high mass he goes on to explain the october 29th to 31st pilgrimage it's interesting that all of this was going on at the same time that biden was in rome quite a quite a (laughs) convergence of things (laughs) so this pilgrimage held annually since 2012 followed its usual practice of beginning with traditional vespers on friday at the basilica of saint maria ad mart uh, Martires, the ancient pantheon. Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament then followed on Saturday morning, continuing with, with a procession to St. Peter's Basilica, where a solemn high mass 
was offered at the altar of the chair. And that's what you're seeing in the video now. Correct. Yes. That, percent, the, yes. that magnificent. Yes. That's a wonderful photograph. Um, so, you know, Edward goes on to explain that it's, this is obviously going on in the aftermath of Traditionis Custodes. Uh, the Samoran Pontificum pilgrimage, he says, took place just months after Pope Francis issued his motu proprio Traditionis Custodes that limited, uh, really severely restricted the celebration the, and access to the traditional Latin Mass and reversed um, Benedict XVI's 2007 motu proprio Samorum Pontificum, which we've um, reported on, of course, extensively. And so if, we, if you scroll down, maybe just to see some more of those photos to give people an idea of of what the, the pilgrimage looked like on the ground, it's got some great, great scenes of the procession. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, yeah, and while you were talking, I had, I was, uh, while you were reading, I was doing that. Oh, okay, very good. Yes. So, let's see here. The, just trying to see, I think a Monsignor, I was trying to remember who offered the Mass on the Feast of Christ the King. I thought it was a priest that I recognized his name. I, Monsignor Books, maybe? Let me see if I can find that real quick. No, it wasn't him. Oh, no, it was uh, Father Bart. That's who it was, Father Bart. Abbe oh, Claude Bart. Bart. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I I, uh, I don't know if they were just planned not to have a bishop this year before Traditionis Custodis, or if that's a fallout from Traditionis Custodis. I'm not sure. Although yeah, I think the sure pilgrimage needs to rename itself now. Uh, well, now yeah, that some more pontificums, no more. I vote, my vote is it should call itself Traditionis Custodes pilgrimage <laughs> as a pun yes. on, because they are the real tradition guardians of tradition those absolutely those traditional mass but interesting question in the chat from uh, betty which frankly betty i don't know the answer to uh how did all these pilgrims get into saint peter's without the uh you know one in the arm uh, i don't know and uh, if i had to guess it, it was all for show and they don't they're not really checking people walking into the church i hope that's the case because i'm sure there had to be some I think the one, uh, yeah, you're referring to the um, the mandate in yes. that, that's now in place in Vatican, Vatican City. City. I think yes. the one exception to the mandate, as I understand it, is for liturgical functions. But ah. as you can as you can see from the photographs, even the you know the priests and and uh, I was told by people you know someone who attended that you can see them wearing masks. They had to put the masks on. Uh -huh. It's sad to see the the priests in traditional vestments and berettas processing in there with masks on, but. Uh, it is what it is. So I did want to read this quote uh, from um, uh, Abbe Claude Bart, who I think, if I remember correctly, Archbishop Vigano did an interview with him. I forget when yes, that took place uh, exactly. Over the summer on the liturgy, yes. Yes. So uh, Edward Penton reports, in his homily at the concluding Mass of the Pilgrimage on Sunday, Father Claude Bart said the Feast of Christ the King, established by Pius XI in 1925, aimed to remind the faithful that nations once baptized must follow the Lord's mandate to reinstate, quote, the regency of Christ over all institutions so that they may be, quote, properly called Christian cities. That was a challenge then uh, and is even more so now, he observed. But in spite of this, he added, we must continue to maintain our hope in the Catholic city. Uh, P Penton goes on, Father Bart, chaplain of the Samoran Pontificum pilgrimage, recalled that the traditional form of the Roman Mass was formed when the West, quote, was becoming and constituting itself as Christian. The Roman Mass, he said, quote, was fully constituted when the ideal of Christianity reached its maturity. It is a Mass of Christianity. Really, it is the Mass of all ages. Mm. So... We, uh, we're glad that it was able to be offered in St. Peter's Basilica, and we just have to continue to do everything in our power to continue defending it, which is kind of our, our final note for this week's report. If you haven't seen it yet, Brian was uh, able to interview Dr. Peter Kwasniewski about a new uh, collection of essays opposing Traditionis Custodes available from Angelical Press called From Benedict's Peace to Francis's War. So I don't, Brian wanted to maybe yes. summarize the interview, and we encourage so, people to watch it. 
Yes, and here you can see it on our Rumble channel here, Liturgical War and Peace. Uh, it's a great book. We're also going to review it in the paper. Uh, brings together 70 different reactions to Traditionis Custodis from a whole variety of, uh, of people. Names you'll recognize, some maybe that are new. Uh, but we had a great discussion about not just the book, but how we should be reacting to uh, Traditionis Custodis. And uh, uh, we're, we're definitely uh, on, both Peter and I were on the war side. We, we are going to war to defend it, uh, not lying down and just rolling over. So it's a really lively spirited uh, discussion we have on the topic. Yes. All right. Great. Well, thank you all. Thanks to our live viewers for another lively uh, afternoon with you. Again, following you in the comments. Looks like you're you're sharing thoughts with each other. Um, and uh, please, if you've enjoyed this, once the the recording is available, please share it with um, your everyone you know. Get the get the word out for people. Help us be an apostle for uh, the content that we're making available. And uh, as always, you can help support the work of Catholic Family News by buying a monthly subscription. We have recently launched our new subscription management system. I know a lot of you have been frustrated and had problems in the past renewing and, and buying subscriptions. You can now purchase subscriptions online, either in the e-edition form only or the print. So up until recently yes. you had to call in the office or write in and through the snail mail. You can now choose your subscription options online. Uh, everyone gets e-edition access, but you can also pay to have a paper for as little as $42 in the United States. Uh, so Thank you for your patience. If you've struggled with our back office systems, which were definitely not working very well, the new system seems to be much better. And yes. your e-edition will now be available on a new platform, and you'll be receiving an email uh, telling you how to trans transition over to the new yes. the new platform. So please consider supporting us. Uh, that not only produces the paper, but supports all of our free content that we make available uh, on our yes. various channels. So if, if for anyone interested in purchasing a subscription uh, now through our website, you just go to our, our homepage, catholicfamilynews.com, and you'll see towards the top of the page, there are several tabs, one of which is new subscription. So you just click on the new subscription tab and scroll down and you'll see, you know, the pricing. And then there's a link that says, click to choose a new subscription option. You click on that and that will take you to the new um, mm -hmm. Uh, subscription management system page where you can sign up online mm -hmm. either uh, for a one-year subscription print and digital uh, or one-year subscription digital only. Mm -hmm. So we hope that this will be much smoother and uh, a better experience for our subscribers. Yes. All right. Well, well let's we end as, yes. as we always do with a prayer. Yes, we'll say, uh, invoke Our Lady in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou may put division in the camp of thy enemies. For as thy beloved Son has said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. St. Charles Barmeo. Pray for us. Pray for us. And may the souls of the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, thank you for sharing an hour with us this week. We look forward to seeing you same time, same day next week, and to discuss uh, the next stories that emerge over the next seven days. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Bless you. Have a, have a uh, wonderful, wonderful, happy, and holy weekend.